That's passing one, two. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah, we're here. Okay, welcome to Live Church. All you that are here already look like the heat is keeping separating the people today, so we don't need to do that today, right? I'm gonna ask you to rise to your feet and let's have an awesome, awesome time of worship. And unfortunately, we have to try to squeeze in a little more in, in our service. That's okay. We're going to do our best, and we'll leave the, to God the rest, right? So, Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your goodness, your grace. I thank you for your mercy that you have every morning, that we can have a, that we have a new slate to fill every day, Father. We thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Jesus, for coming to die on the cross to save us, to redeem us. And Lord, this morning, we just thank you for this time that we have, that we could come together as a family to worship you, to serve you, and to grow in you together, Lord Jesus. I pray for the team as they worship, Lord God, that they would just lead us into worship, that this morning we could connect one more time, another time with you. And I pray as we connect this morning that we would be refreshed, rejuvenated, and that, Lord, we just want more of what you have for us. We want to understand, Lord, we want more understanding of your grace and what you have meant and made us to be, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go for it, guys. God of the mountain 
He's the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. around my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms make way for spring And every season from away I 
promises in fulfillment all over my See the evidence of your goodness. Why well, we don't join me and close your eyes and just just remember the evidence of his goodness.
Thank you, Father, because I don't know. I'm not sure, Lord, if my life was before, Lord, my life was a mess. My finance was a mess. I was condemned to live my entire eternity in hell. But your goodness came. Your grace came. Your mercy. And I can testify that your goodness, the evidence of your goodness is in my life. I cannot deny your goodness. I cannot deny, Lord, your goodness. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for your sacrifice. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Lord. I was just remembering a few days ago, I was reading about the prayer that Jesus did when he went after he was talking with his disciples, just about to go to the cross. He made a long prayer. It's in John chapter 24, something like that, I remember. So he made a long prayer. And that, that if you read, I was reading carefully, and he said all the time, he was talking about, but please, I pray for them. I pray for them. He was going through so much at that time that he did not even care about himself. He just cared about his disciples and the ones that were coming. There was you and I. He was so, he's so good that he, even though the Bible says that he was sweating blood, he was going through so much suffering that he didn't care about himself. He cared about you and I. He said, God, I pray that you, like you and I, we are one. They will become one in me. That was his only prayer many times. In that, I mean, this, wow. And with the heart of gratefulness, we're going to say, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Because I was not worthy, but you make me worthy. And you make me your righteousness, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because I have eternity in you, Jesus. And even when I fail and I make mistakes, you remain faithful and your mercy is new every day. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes.
thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be here, for giving the opportunity to give you praise and to bless. Thank you for sending the blessings for us that we have already received. Today we ask you to fill us with your spirit and help us to help others. Every day I walk with you, Lord, and I know you have never left me. Even if at times I feel like you're not there, Lord, I have to remind myself that you are. So we thank you, Lord, as a church, as a body of Christ. We thank you for waking us up this morning and to give us another day of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Do you guys have another song? No? Okay, you guys can grab a seat. Okay, you, everybody's seated already. That's good. That's a good thing. We are, we are a little bit kind of confused with this one hour, right? This is messing up the entire service. Man, let's ask God to give us more time to praise him and to worship him. It's like you feel a little bit uncomfortable. We don't feel freedom to, man. It's time to honor God um, with our offerings. And let's just want to remind you guys that the Bible says that if you give, it will be giving in to you. And I want to read this Bible verse. That it's in Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, Give, and it will be giving in to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And this applies to everything in our lives, not just for our offerings. And as I was, many times as I was mentioning about my um, experience with offerings, right? At the beginning, it was hard for me to give or, or to, you know, take out a dollar to the offerings to the church. But I have learned that at the measure or at the level that you give, you will receive in every area of your life. And it's not just about money. But in every single area that you give to, your, to, to God and to others, you will receive. You will see the reward from God when you act, when you put action into the giving. Also, remember the motivations of your heart. Everything that you do, do it for God. Do it for Him. To honor Him. To worship Him. To please him. Amen? Amen? I want you guys, it's, it's, I, feel, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know why. It's so, I, I don't, my goodness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We ask, Lord, that any distraction, Father, that is around will leave in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that every second and every minute, will be fruitful, Lord. We pray, Father, that, that we're going to be able to worship you and to honor you with everything that we are and everything that we have. I pray that whoever is going through difficult times in finance, Lord, you will just make miracles like you did it with me, like you did it with so many others here, Father. And if you believe right now, I'm telling you, if you believe that God can make miracles in your finance, just pray with me. Father, I believe you will make a miracle in my finance. Father, I know I make mistakes and I know I have failed making a, being a good administrator of yours or your finance, Lord. And I believe that you are going to teach me how to be a good servant. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
we have the buckets, one on this side, one on the other side. So feel free, parte, please. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Life Church. It is it's kind of it's kind of like a kick in the butt again to get back to an hour, right? But we will do the best we can to keep it at that, right? But you just relax and receive what God has for you this morning, right? And um, I want to see if this joke works. I've learned that there's just like there's different cultures in life. There's different jokes that people understand. And so anyway, they, they, this, um, they're, they're, the question is, do you know how we know that, that heat is faster than cold? Anybody knows why, how we know that heat is faster than cold? Because you can catch a cold. <laughs> hey, and that got it. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I just, I just felt... Two people got it. Two people. You know what catch a cold is? You know what cold is, right? So you can catch a cold, but you never hear a person say catch a heat, right? So that means heat is faster. Anyway. Um, can I dismiss the kids? Oh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Kids, super kids. Raise your hands, super kids. Kids up to six years old. I see one, two, three... Four, five. You have supervisors today. Adriana is going to take you to the back room. All right? So you can go now. All kids up to six years old. Kyle will be helping. He's a superhero. Oh, I thought he was six years. <laughs> Lord, we just speak peace over all the children today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome to Life Church. It is an another amazing morning. With all these things happening around us, you sometimes don't know if it is Wednesday morning or Saturday afternoon, right? But you know what the good thing is? That we don't need to worry. We know the one who has everything figured out. And so as long as we keep connected to that one, we don't need to worry. I know I've seen all of these posts that say, the, the, you know... The end is almost here. It has been for the last 2,000 years. But I can tell you one thing. That it is an awesome time to be alive. Here's why. Now more than ever, your character, the way you live, how you handle things, is being seen and watched by people. Because what you see when pressure comes... You see, your true character is not tested until there's pressure. And so when true pressure comes, then you can see who a person really is. As long as everything is hunky-dory and everything is good, you have all the finances you need, everybody's your friend, nobody talks against you, nobody believes that you're a crazy head, everything is good, then you, you don't need much to, to, to please them, right? But when it comes to the point where, where your belief or your convictions don't match with everybody else, that's when your true character comes out. How you're going to deal with people like that. Because now with this situation we're in, we have, we have people on all sides of the, of the fence, right? And they're all right and they're all wrong, right? So now how do we honor each other and, and keeping our love on, keeping our honor on for each other with different opinions, right? And so anyway, that has nothing to do with the message. I just thought I should share it, right? Um, announcements. We had said last month that we were going to start to have prayer meetings every one week a month here. And um, we're going to do it this week. So this week from Monday to Friday, we're going to be here every morning 6 a.m. 
6 a.m. right here at church. We're going to spend one hour praying. And anybody who wants can come out. 6 a.m. right here. You might say, oh, but I don't know how to pray well. That's okay. Nobody of us does. We just do the best we can, right? And so come out at 6 a.m., whoever can, right here from Monday to Friday. And we have seen miracles. We have seen amazing things happening from doing it. So come out and expect God to move on your behalf and on behalf of his kingdom, right? Um, and then Tuesday night, another good night of worship. So come out. Come here. Spend some time in the presence of God and worship as we um, love to just bring heaven down to touch earth, right? Is there anything else? Youth. 4, 4 p.m. on Saturday again. Bring out the youth. And let's change the city. And, once you, and when you're on your knees praying anyway. Sounds kind of weird, right? But um, our worship team is going down south to Punta Gorda. Um, the 16th of July. 15th. And we're, they are going to be. Um, do, they're going to do the worship for, the, for a youth event. That they're, that they're having down in Punta Gorda at. The Machaca camp. So I uh, ask you all just to uh, keep, just pray for the, for the team, for safety and guidance and for the anointing just to flow through them that as they lead worship that it would, it would just release the presence of God to a new level like ever before, right? And so if you just could do that. Um, this Saturday we're going to Cayo. To Cayo, yes. Uh, for a treasure hunt, which those of you that don't know what that is, it's a form of evangelism. So we're heading down there Friday evening, coming back Saturday with a small team. If anyone else here really wants to join, talk to me after service, and we could still throw you in as well. That's right. So pray for us as we go this weekend. Just we want to see more people saved. That's right. San Ignacio, Cayo, our hometown, right? Used to be our hometown. Now it's our foreign town. Anyway. Um, this morning we want to we this month of of, of July um, we want to be speaking on grace and um, I know that's an interesting word to teach on and in our leadership meeting the other day we spoke on on, on grace and um, we were asking who wants to preach on grace and everybody felt the same way I did <laughs> but I, I I'm the pastor at the end of the day the buck stops at me right um, and so we. Grace is something that we all like, but it's very, sometimes I feel like it's, it's for me, it has been hard to put into words. Um, and so we're going to see what God's going to do. And I know it's going to be an amazing, amazing testimony and service. We have, no, we have 30 more minutes. We ask many people. By the way, though, before I say that, we're going to try to do some team preaching today. So you can cheer us on because we've never done this before. Well. Sort of. We are We're going to practice today. So that means that there's nothing to base on. So bad, good, or ugly, we still do the best, right? <laughs> and so, you want to start? I just want to say about grace that, you know, I ask many people, what does grace mean to you? And most people start stuttering a little bit before they actually share a little bit about it. And when I say that, I speak from my heart as well, because that used to be me for many, many years too, that grace is just something I felt like I didn't get a handle on. I didn't understand. I didn't... It, and it, it's such a deep word that it's hard to understand it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. But um, so I asked many people, and they weren't really sure how to explain it. And I asked... Um, Pastor Craig, the same thing. Like, if you were to teach on grace, what would you teach? And he said, Jesus. It's just that simple. And then I asked um, Pastor John, who was preaching here last Sunday. By the way, did you guys like his teaching? Oh, it was good, right? It was fire, right? So I asked him, if you were to teach on grace, what would you teach? And he said, Jesus. Exact same answer. It's just that simple. But it's not as simple to live, though. And here's why, because um, we as humans, it is natural, I guess, for us as a human being that we want to do our best to live the best we can, right? And so grace, um, it's easy to say, oh, grace is, we, we, we don't get what we deserve and we don't, we don't deserve what we get, right? But when it comes, when, it, when, when the rubber hits the road... And you have to really deal with it in your own personal life. It is not as easy sometimes, right? 
Because you really want, when somebody does you something wrong, you really feel like that guy needs a punishment, right? Or that guy really needs to, to hear, or like somebody said, I, I give him my, my thoughts, or I, I give him a couple of words. Yeah, probably you did, but I don't know what you did anyway, right? But, and so grace, grace is just um, it's so, so complex, but it's, it's so simple. Um, when you understand this, what Jesus is and what, who he was and what he did. So this morning we're going to talk about um, what helped me to understand grace or us. I learned a lot, a lot, a lot of grace from Joseph Prince. I also learned a lot from our pastors, and I'll share my testimony in the end. But there's um, great teachings on grace, and so we're going to talk about the things that have helped us to understand what it really means. And to bring that point across, we'll talk a little bit about what was life like before the cross and what is it like after the cross so that you can better understand. Okay. I know that, that as, as the modern and modern day, but for the last many years, you, see, you easily see the Ten Commandments all over, right? Anybody here has, not, has never seen the Ten Commandments? Anybody does not know what the Ten Commandments? Okay, so everybody knows. And that is, that is a fair deal. The only problem with that is that just like you cannot mix oil with water, you cannot mix ten, the, the Ten Commandments and grace. Jesus and Ten Commandments do not mix. You say, but heck, that's in the Bible. Yes, it is in the Bible. But when you understand why the Ten, man, can, man, the ten Commandments came, I am eating my own words. When the Ten Commandments were given, you need to know why they were given, at what point, and what the reason was to understand why they came. Because you, what you need to understand is that in the days of Abraham, you know that the Bible says that Abraham lived by faith? You know that there was no Ten Commandments in the time of Abraham. In the time of Moses, there was no, when he grew up, there was no Ten Commandments. When he was called to, to bring out, the, to take out the, 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 Jew, uh, the Jews, the Israelites out of Egypt, there was no Ten Commandments. So no, no matter how much they sinned, they were not punished. Why? You see, when they went through the, the, um, when they went through the Red Sea, it was separated. And they walked through, and they were murmuring. And the Bible says murmuring is sin, right? So they murmured, and God opened the sea, and they were okay again. They walked through the sea, and the other side, they needed water. And they murmured again, sinned again. Nothing happened. God gave them water. Oh, they murmured again. They were hungry. God gave them the, the birds, how you call it, manna, all that stuff, right? And they murmured, and God did not punish them. And then they came to the Mount of Zion. Zion what's the name? Sinai. And God said, you know what? I want to meet with my people. And the people said, you know what? They boost to God. They said, you know what, God? You see, they look back and say, you know what? Well, what we went through? We can do what the heck you asked us to do. You just tell us and we're going to do it. So they were boosting about their own capability to do the right thing. And God said, okay. You're boasting about who you are? Let me show you. And that is when the Ten Commandments were given. When the people boosted about their capability... About, who, about the, 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 how perfect they were or how good they can do what God wants to do. And that's when God showed them. He sent the Ten Commandments. And He said, here, you keep that, you're perfect. If you break one, you sin. If you break one, you break all. That day, 3,000 died. Why? Because they boosted. And God wanted to show them that, that you are alone by yourself. You cannot do it at all. I don't usually share jokes, but uh, do you guys know when the first Madison came about? The first Madison that... So, God gave Moses two tablets. Oh, yeah. Moses was the first one to receive tablets. <laughs> Why <dimension>? Anyways, <laughs> not everyone's getting that. He wrote the commandments on a tablet, right? And not the iPad or the... Samson tablets, not those kind of tablets either. It was something else, more like a stone tablet. But what Corny was saying is when the law was given, 3,000 people died. Now, 
when grace came, when Jesus came, grace came. And that day, 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people got added to the kingdom. So you see the law or grace. Um, the first miracle of Moses, he turned water into blood, which was resulting in death. In the first miracle of grace, Jesus turned water into wine, which resulted in life and celebration. So, law leads to death. Grace leads to life. And, and I know that I have not heard this. I have, actually, I have never heard. I have never heard anybody telling me, actually, in words, that because of grace we can do what we want and God's going to save us. I know I always hear that saying all over, but I never heard actually a person telling me that, right? But grace, grace is, is a merited favor. You get what you don't deserve and you don't, deserve, don't, you don't get what you deserve. But law will show you sin, right? So when I say that, that, that Jesus and law does not mix, it's because the law brings death and Jesus brings life. And so when we understand that, that um, in the Old Testament when, or when the, 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 the um, law was given, you made a mistake, what happened? Anybody knows what happened? You were punished. You were punished for your sin, right? Anytime you did something wrong... Something happened with my... Well, that's okay. So every time you, you did wrong, you were punished. Why? Because you were living under the law. Because the law could not do anything else than show you the wrong, right? But when Jesus came, he took on the punishment for you. So in the, in, in, in the grace, in grace now that we live, and here is why it is so crucial for churches and pastors and everybody here to, to understand and con turn from, from law to grace... Because law only kills. Law never gives life. So when people say, that, oh, I keep the Ten Commandments, that doesn't mean that you're saved. Because Ten Commandments can be kept by anybody in the world. Anybody. You do not have to be saved to have the Ten Commandments on your vehicle, on your forehead, on your, your church, on your building. And you can say them, you can know them. But just what grace did, grace requires much more. You see, the Ten Commandments says, um, thou shalt not kill. You know what Jesus said? Love your enemies. You see, so that does not mix. And, and in the law, in the law, when you made a mistake, you were, you were like I said, severely punished. And so when, when, I, when, when we operate under law, then everything that we do wrong is punished. And I know that, that many of you come from, from, from churches that where, where the biggest thing that happens in church is discipline. And you know, discipline is important if it's needed. But how it's done is the difference between law and grace. If I, if I discipline anybody that's in church here, if you're serving in church, and, and I'm more concerned of how it looks from the outside, and I'm, I'm more concerned um, that, I be, uh, that I stay the boss, that's law. Grace always keeps people beyond task. Above task. What does that mean? That as a pastor, as a leader, as a human being, whoever deals with people, that in grace, you're always more concerned about the person's heart than the task you want to accomplish. Okay? What does that mean? That means that, that when a person does something wrong, a wrong does not need to be punished. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross for every sin, every mistake, Everything that you can ever do, he died already. You have to accept it, but he did it already. So your sin is not punishable because Jesus took up everything that you could, that before him you had to take. And so when you understand that, let's say my dad, I know as parents, and, and we, grew up, we grew up that way. We grew up in a very religious environment where, where it's, everything is about um, you do this, you get this. You don't do this, you don't get that, right? Let's say you do a little wrong, you get punished. You don't, you, you know, like there's no grace, no, no freedom. There's just like, like everything is do's and don'ts, right? So what happens? When I grew up in a place where, where if I made a mistake, I was punished. 
or if I didn't do everything enough, good enough, I was not accepted, then that's what, what we bring into our families when we start uh, having our own kids. And then we try to make our little kids that are just, just starting to live. I mean, heck, they don't even know how to live. I mean, they're just months old. And then they t grow a little bit. And we, we, we require from them that they cannot accomplish. Why? Because they haven't learned. But that's what law does. And then everything they do, you know, you make a little mistake, bang, you get slapped. You make another mistake, bang, you get punished. Where is Jesus and all that? Where is Jesus and all that? And that, that, goes back, that goes all the way to the end of we, uh, all our lives. Like it goes to church, it goes to business, everywhere. And, and so, law separates you from God. Remember, sin cannot be in the presence of God. So when law came, it just showed you what God wanted. But it showed you that you cannot do what he wants you to do. And that's why Jesus came. I'd say it's time we start, we move our pulpits from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. Amen? Yeah. Maybe you don't understand what that means. Mount Sinai is where the Ten Commandments were given. Mount Zion is where Jesus gave himself. So, can I get an amen? It's time yes. to move the pulpit and move it from Mount Sinai, move it to Mount Zion, where we operate in grace. Amen. With that being said, let's look at what Jesus um, what Jesus said to the leper in Matthew, mm -hmm. somewhere in Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 8. 28, yeah. 28? 8, verse 1, 2. Oh, Matthew 8. Um, so Jesus um, met a leper. Now, for you to understand this story, let's talk about what leopards were like. When you have leprosy in those days, you were like unclean. So if you'd be walking around somewhere and you would have to shout really loudly, unclean, unclean, so that everyone would know and they'd stay far away from you. So there's this person after Jesus came down from Mount Zion, right? From oh. some mountain. He I don't was, know which one. He was preaching. He was on the mountain preaching to the people. So whichever yeah, mountain, he loved mountains and so do I. But uh, he came down from a mountain. He met this leopard. And the leopard said, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. He knew that Jesus was able, but he didn't know if Jesus would be willing. So he said, Lord, if you're willing. And of course, Jesus was willing. And he said, be clean. But he didn't only say it, he touched him. See, Jesus did something completely against the law, because leopards, you were supposed to stay far away. But he went and he touched him. Not to mention COVID now, we're supposed to stay six feet away. I sometimes wonder what Jesus thinks about that. I'm not telling you now to run out and be stupid, but I'm just thinking, you know, if we really represented him really well, we would go touch them and tell them to be healed. That's what he did. Yes. Another story, um, the difference between what happens to a person when he experiences grace. Jacob. You know about Jacob in the Bible? Jacob and Esau, two, a tw set of twins that were born to Isaac and Rebecca. Right? Isaac and Rebecca. Anyway, um, yes, so I, Esau and Jacob. Jacob's name means um, deceiver or something like it, right? It would, it's not, not the best name to have in those days, right? Um, but anyway, he deceived his brother by taking his birthright and getting the blessings of a firstborn, right? Because remember, Jacob was born right after Esau. Esau was first, even though they're twins. Esau was born first, and then Jacob came. So by those laws in those days, Esau should have gotten the, all the blessings. And in those days... The firstborn got 60% of all the inheritance and all the rest, 40% were divided among all the kids. And so Jacob took advantage of his son, his son, his brother, and he deceived his brother. Even though he said, I'm going to give you the soup and you're going to go, but it was a deception, right? And so Jacob ran away from home and he felt so bad about it. Just imagine, just imagine you know that you took your brother's stuff that was his, right? And so he ran he ran away because he thought they're going to want to kill him, right? And it says that he ran and he was in, in, at Bethel, um, um, at, in a place called Bethel. He was there for the night. It says he was sleeping with his head on the rock. And at night he had a vision and he saw the um, a stairway to heaven, angels coming up and down. And you know, it says there that he asked God for a blessing. And you know, Jacob right there, he, was, he felt so condemned because of what he did. And you know, it says that he got up 
and was encouraged to go on a life when he experienced the grace of God. This was even before the Ten Commandments came. But he sinned. And when he experienced that God still loved him, and God showed him the promise. Remember God, um, Abraham got a promise from God that all your generations will be blessed for generations to come. So Jacob, knowing he deceived his brother and his family or maddled him what he did, and he lays there sleeping on a hard rock, and then he experiences the grace of God. And God tells him, you know what? I made a promise to you and your generations to come. And I'm not, I'm not going to break it. And this is what I want you to understand, everybody here. This can radically change your life. If you think that whatever you have done will alter the blessings that God has for you, or has altered the blessings God has for you, you're, then that means you're still living under law. In grace, your, your wrongs are not going to alter the blessings that God has for you. And that alone is worth worshiping God. Knowing that our, uh, our mistakes or shortcomings do not alter the blessings that God has promised you. And what has God promised you? The same promises that God gave Abraham, you can claim for yourself. All the promises. And in the Old Testament, in the Old, it says that um, if you do these things, you'll be blessed. If you, if you do all these things, you'll be blessed. And, and Deuteronomy, think Deuteronomy it says. But what did Jesus say? In me, all... Well, it's actually in Corinthians that he said, and Jesus, that all the blessings are yes and amen. Yes and amen. So Jacob, un, feeling condemned and guilty when he experienced the grace of God and that God would not alter his promises, that just radically changed his life. So that's just such a good picture between grace again, grace and law, you know, that he experienced grace. Did he deserve it? Probably not. Just like the leopard here, he had done nothing to deserve it. But, oh, what I want to say is that in, uh, under the law, like the leopard, the unclean make the clean unclean. Uh -huh. Let me say that again. The unclean make the clean, clean unclean. unclean. I'll give you an example. So if I had leprosy, I would have to stay away from all of you because you're all clean. So what that means is that I'm unclean, and I could make all of you clean, Un unclean. Yep. That's under law. Now, under grace, under sin, uh, under sin, under law, sin is contagious. Sickness is contagious. But under grace, righteousness and God's goodness is contagious. So now under grace, the clean can make the unclean clean. It switches the whole picture. Yep. So those that are sick, those that have sinned, you know what? I, my, the goodness of God in my life is going to be contagious. And my clean will make your unclean clean. Exactly. So if any one of you has weaknesses in your life, you mess up in your life, what does it do if I come, not just me, if anybody else that, that is living right comes to you? His righteousness rubs off on you. Not your weakness rubs off on the righteousness. So for somebody to tell me that I cannot go and hang out with sinners because I'm going to become a sinner is saying that the unclean has more power than the clean. When Jesus said, if I touch the unclean, the, the unclean becomes clean because I'm clean. So if you're a righteousness of God, whenever you come into the presence of anybody else, your righteousness is rubbing off on the unrighteousness. So however, you need to understand where you stand with God. And so... What is my point? My point is this, that in the Old Testament, Old Law, and a lot of churches still preach this. Not the churches, but the people in there. They still preach this, that if you hang out with these bad people, you're going to become bad. But in the, the truth is, if you know who you are in Christ, you, what you are is going to rub off on those people. And so that's who you're called to be. And that's what is living under grace, where you're going to take your righteousness and you're going to touch those people who are unrighteous. And when you touch them, they're going to become righteous because you're righteous in Christ Jesus. And so when you understand that, you're going to start living different because you know that whoever you touch will become like you are. If you're right, that means they want to make sure you're righteous in Christ. You can, you know, but so, and you might say, oh, but I have some, I have some weaknesses in my life. Um, I want anybody who has no weakness, please stand up. Anybody has no weakness? Maras, everybody have problems? Yeah. Okay. Here's my point. Your problems do not define who you are. 
the righteousness of Christ Jesus defines who you are. So when you understand grace, you understand that who you are in Christ Jesus rubs off on other people when you touch them. And so under law, if you touch an unclean person, you become unclean. So if you go and you hang out, that's why. If you, look, if you read the New Testament, you see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those seeds you see there, they had a huge problem with Jesus hanging out with the sinners. Why? Because in the law, if you hung out with sinners, you became a sinner. In the law, if you hang out with the sick people, you became sick. In the law, if you hang out with people that are wrong, you are wrong. But in grace, when well, Jesus came, when you go and hang out with sinners, you don't become a sinner. Your righteousness rubs off on them. And they change because of your righteousness. And that is what it is living under grace. So you do not need to be afraid of all the sinners around you or the people living wrong. What you need to do is rub off your righteousness on them so they change and become who God has created them to be. Amen? So grace is what you need. Law is not going to get you far. The law only gets you to your knees and then right there you're going to die because it can't do anything for you. Wow, fire. Zacchaeus is a perfect example. Everyone know the story of Zacchaeus? Wee little man. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. If you don't know the story, you know the song, right? So um, he was a small little man. It says that all, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So I think he fell short because he was Very short. super short. So Jesus walks by, and he sees him on a tree because he climbed up on a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. Apparently the crowd was there, and he couldn't look over them, I assume. So he climbed up on a tree. And the people there all knew Zacchaeus, and they knew he was a sinner. Evil man. So Jesus walks up to him, and he says, come down from there because I'm going to your house. Can you imagine the gossip that started in a crowd there? He's going to this sinner's house. He's a tax collector. He's stealing money, and Jesus is going to his house. Exactly. Let me take that story right there. Today we're going to go two hours. We're going to just repent one time for it, right? Anyway, um, let me take that story. Zacchaeus had one encounter with Jesus. What happened? Zacchaeus was an evil man. Zacchaeus would, would be in today's days those custom officers who want all your money under the table so you can give you a little bit of breaks, right? Okay, he was a man who would, he would, he would not just do that. He would, when you, because he was a tax collector, so when you came into his territory, he would charge you extra um, just because he, would, he could do it, right? And so... We would call him one of the evilest persons, right? I mean, you know, the sin is sin is sin, right? It doesn't really matter. But in our eyes, some sin is a little bigger than others, right? Our sin is usually a little less than other ones. But this one here was the little bigger one, right? And you look at that story. It says there that, that, that he was in a tree because he was so small. And he was... And every, and look, can you imagine, can you imagine a, 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 a tax collector, a custom officer, uh, climbing a tree somewhere to see you? But anyway, that was kind of humility, right? But anyway, he, Jesus came by and, and saw him. And, and that, that itself told Jesus that that guy wanted something that he had, right? One encounter with Jesus. This, this guy here, this guy was just finished, probably just finished um, robbing somebody or, 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 or just, you know, like taking money. Was his, maybe, maybe even that morning, we don't know, right? But that was his job, what, what he did. And he said, Jesus came to his house. I don't know. We don't know if there was 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or 30 minutes in between. But the Bible does not record any preaching. Anybody has ever read this any preaching? No? But what happened? One encounter with Jesus himself. One encounter with grace. See, grace came to his house. Because he knew he was an evil man. He knew that what he did was completely wrong. How do we know? Because he said, what did he say? That I'll give away half of my, my stuff that I have. I'll give it away. And if I ever rip off somebody, I'm going to pay back double, right? Isn't that what he said? Jesus hadn't preached anything yet. Jesus hadn't said, oh, you know what? If you want to, if you want to get into heaven, you have to do all these things. You have to give away this. You have to go to your mother alive and repent of all the things you've stolen from here. You have to do, he did nothing. Just the presence of grace coming into his life. Yep. He said, you know what, Jesus? My God, I screwed up bad. I'm going to go away half of the stuff I've stolen. Because he stole a lot of stuff. And half of that I have, I'm going to give away. And if I ever make a mistake of, of, of taking too much, I'm going to give them back double. You see, we believe. We believe. As humans, 
we have this feeling because love has been driven into our heads like a hammer and a nail that we feel like that I need to tell you how evil you are for you to repent. That is law-based preaching. If anybody, you ever hear somebody teaching to you how evil you are, how evil all they are, that is not grace, that is not Jesus, that's not of the, of the New Testament. That is coming straight from the law that was given and that only brings death. I have yet to find someone who becomes better from being condemned. But I have met lots of you who have changed your lives because you realize how good Jesus is. You see, when Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, he did not tell him all the craziness he was doing. He did not tell him how many times he sinned. You know what? Zacchaeus confessed it. He, he, he choked it. He just gave it out. He just had to do nothing else than just show him grace. You know what? Everybody hates you. I'll be here for you. Me and you are the buddies. We are going to make it together. You see, he brought grace. He only experienced law up to that day. But he, grace came to his house and knocked on his door. And he confessed, and he changed, and he said, I'm going to give half away. See, that's the difference between grace and law. If Jesus had operated in law, he would have told him of all the sin he's done. But now Jesus came, and just his presence alone. And the Bible says in Romans that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Whenever you think that somebody needs to get sick, or somebody needs to experience something bad to come closer to God... It's a thought from the law. It's not a thought from grace. Because the Bible says that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. When you understand, when you experience the full grace, when you experience even a little bit of grace, you say, you know what? If that's how God thinks about me, I have to serve him. If that's how he feels about me, I have to do the right thing. If that's how he sees me as a clean child, as a righteousness of Christ, as, as a person who is righteousness in front of God, Hey, I want to serve that person. I want to serve that. I want to do everything I can to live right. So that is why I believe, and I can back it up in scriptures, that I don't need to teach you all the wrongs and what you shouldn't do. If I teach you a relationship with Christ, if I teach you who, what Christ did for you, that's going to drive you to do better. That's going to drive you to live in grace and operate and do the right things. Amen? Amen. To add to that, many believe... Till this day, there's many people that believe they're sick because of some sin they've done in their life. And where that idea might come from is because several times when Jesus healed someone, he said, your sins are forgiven you. However, let me tell you that you're not sick. If you're struggling with sickness, you're not sick because of sin, because sin was taken care of on the cross a long time ago. That was taken care of. So you are not sick because of sin. Yeah. However... Some of us, including myself in the past, I got sick because of self-condemnation. Yep. Now, that's how the accuser is going to try to come to you. Yep. It's, you know, sin is taken care of, but now he's going to try to accuse you and say, you did something wrong. You did this and you did that. He will always accuse you. When you did something right, he'll tell you you didn't do enough good. You're not good enough. You need to do more. When you do something wrong, he still says you're doing something wrong. You know, he'll always, always accuse you. You're never good enough. So you're not sick because of sin, but self-condemnation. To get rid of that, turn your thoughts from self and turn it to the cross. That's turn right. Turn it to Jesus. Amen. And so if the thought, the thought that I have to suffer or, or some, some people, they, they drive along the road and bang, their tires flat. Oh, my God. They think, oh, shucks, somewhere I did a wrong thing. Oh, my God. I cursed out somebody or something gone on wrong, right? People have their beliefs. That's not in the Bible, you know. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it didn't say that, oh, Jesus didn't say, you know what, I'm going to take all the sins except for that one sin right there that the guy is going to do and, and with the pickup. No, he didn't do that. He took all sins, right? So, yes, or, or lifestyles have consequences. If you run on the road, the pickup will knock you down and you might die. But that's not because of sin or law. That's because you're foolish and run on the road, Right? And we, hopefully we have enough sense to, to listen to the Holy Spirit and don't do those foolishness, right? But the, we, when we understand full grace of God and what He did for us, it, it completely changes what we think about God and the people around us. So when you understand that, you don't have to be perfect anymore to be part of my... You, you don't have to be perfect to be my friend, you know. It, it definitely helps, but you don't have to be, right? And so when we understand grace, what Jesus did for us, we expect less perfection 
And because of that, we receive more perfection. Okay? How, uh, does that make sense? Like if, if, because we understand grace, I don't require you to be perfect. But because I love you in your imperfection, you are going to, you're going to work on yourself to be more better. Because if you understand that, for instance, your boss. I don't know how many of you have a boss that you look up to. Some of you might have bosses you don't like, but that may be different. But if you have a boss that looks up to you, for instance, right? And if you, I know you look up to me because I'm higher, but anyway, if you have a boss in your life that you really admire or, or a hero in your life that you really admire, anybody has heroes in your life? Anybody here has any heroes? I know you have. You just don't want to tell me, but you have, okay? So whoever a hero is, okay? I have a lot of heroes, but anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mention all the names, but if that person comes to you and, you and you really look up to that person and you, like, you just want to be like that person and you just like wash their feet and do their toenails and everything, right? You just, uh, just honor that person, right? Let's say you have a problem with, with driving, you know? You're not all perfect drivers like I am, right? But anyway, if you have a weakness with driving and your hero tells you, man, you know what? I love the way you drive. Man, you are the safest driver ever. And he just praises you how well you are driving. You know what you're going to do? You're going to make sure that you don't let down the person. Right? And then you're, gonna be make, you're even going to become better at, at, at driving because, heck, he thinks I'm good. I know I suck, but he thinks I'm good. I don't want to let him down, right? I don't want to disappoint him. So I'm going to make sure that I improve my driving so when he sees me again next time, that it won't be, it's going to be the same, right? That's the same thing how grace works. When you understand how God looks at you, even though you know it's not true, okay, in your flesh, you know that you have all these mistakes, but you know that God looks at you as a perfect child of God, the righteousness of Christ, you want to become that because He sees that in you. Does that make sense? You're tracking with me? And that is what we want of everyone here. That that's what God wants of you. He wants you to see yourself as He does. And that's why grace came, because you could not. Under the law, you could not be that. Under the law, you were condemned with any little mistake you made. You have to share your testimony, my friend. We could roll on and on and on here, but time is moving too. So I'll share my testimony. We're going to end with a song. Um, I know some of you are thinking you want to go back home to your air condition. And we can't. No um, electricity. Son of a boot. <laughs> Let me tell you, though, we don't have AC here yet. We will in the future. But let me tell you something. There is a really good benefit to being at church early. You get to pick where you want to sit. You can choose the fan or you can, if you come late, you get to choose wherever else. Because the fans are, the seat over there and the seat over here is always first filled. So there's benefits maybe, to being early. You get to choose. Maybe you should bring more fans. Or that. Or put in AC. Hey, if you stick around long enough, we're going to have AC. Hey, you should look back three, four years back. Lynette, we could tell you where we were. Yeah. So anyway, tell us our testimony. So, far. so I'll end it with my testimony. And just to give you an idea of how long it is, my, I'll share two testimonies, one under law, one under grace. The first testimony is about 20 years, and the second testimony is about 20 years. 20 years long? long. 20 years long. Okay, um, bring out your tents. So it's 40 years. And I'm not ashamed to say how old I am because I'm still going to look young even by the time I turn 80. So I'm not afraid to talk about that. Half there. Halfway there. So um, I want to share two experiences from different churches I've been in. My first experience growing up in church, my parents always took me to church, and I will forever be grateful for that. They taught me the importance of going to church. You could never have an excuse big enough to stay home. You can't say I'm tired today. I was doing ministry all day long, Saturday late, working all week. There's no excuse ever good enough to stay home. We couldn't be sick enough to stay home. We couldn't be like, no excuse. We go to church and we're committed to church. We're committed to fellowship. We're committed to serving. And my parents taught me that and I'll forever be grateful. However, the church that brought me up and did not understand grace. So I grew up in a church that did not know about grace. So in my teenage years, I was living in rebellion. Very and much. a lot of rebellion, a lot of my stories <laughs> I'm not proud of. Corny was always the saint. So um, my sto our stories are quite different. But... Uh, as a teenager, you know, looking back, I can see that a lot of my rebellion came because I wanted freedom. 
Back then, I just thought I wanted to just have fun. But I see now a lot of it was I wanted freedom and fun. A lot of it was just that I, didn't, I wasn't meant for religion. And so I did a lot of stupid things. One of them was running away from home from my parents. I was gone for days and wouldn't tell them where I was. I wouldn't let them know because I didn't want them to bring me back home. I didn't want to be beaten. I didn't want to, you know, I just wanted more freedom. And, you know, doing that to your mother is not a good thing. It's not, not a good thing. But that's what I did. Many stories like that that just um, was, was not famous. okay. Was not okay. It was the headline news in the community all the time for all the stupid things I did. You know, running away with my dad's car without driver's license on the highways. And just a lot of stupid things that were not okay. It was different than everyone else. And so the church had a problem with that. Because it was not okay with my family. It was not okay with the church. So the pastors would talk to me. And the only time the pastor would ever talk to you is if you had done something wrong. So the pastor would come talk to me and they tell me that, you know, I'm like this broken part of their body. You know, like our body works together. The Bible says that we're the fingers, the toes, the arms. Like we all work together as a body, like in the body of Christ. So they tell me that I'm like this broken finger and I make them all look so bad. And I'm not good enough for church. I'm not good enough for God. And so they try to tell me all that to try to fix me. But it didn't work. So... I ended up being away from my family for a long time. Another couple from church took me in. They wanted to help me restore my relationship with my family, which was amazing. It didn't work, but their uh -huh. intention was good. So what the church then did, because remember, they didn't know about grace. They don't practice it. So what you do if you have a member that does not apply by the rules, then you kick them out of church. Yes, that's ultimate punishment, condemnation. So that's how they handled the situation. So they decided, okay, I am, they were, they always give you one last chance. So they have a meeting in their church with all the members and around three, four hundred people at that time. So they called a meeting, they had a meeting in church to discuss what they're going to do with me. And remember, I'm 15 years old. So this is the picture I'm getting about church. This is a picture I'm getting about God. So they're having that meeting, and in this meeting, I have an opportunity to defend myself. If my repentance is going to be good enough, then they'll, you know, probably let it pass, and I can continue to be a member. But if I'm not willing to repent, or I don't do it in the right words, then they're just going to kick me out. They call it, like, excommunication. And you need to understand excommunication in, in, in that culture and that environment. When you're excommunicated, you cannot eat with your family. You cannot do business with the community. You cannot buy at the community. You're basically as dead. And they would shun you, make sure that you're gonna, never going to make it in life. You're not allowed to go hug the person. You're not allowed to have anything to do with them. Don't love on them because they don't deserve love. And if they're going to feel bad enough, then they're going to come back into the church to love you. So we're going to just shun you. We're going to hate you. We're, well, they don't say hate. They just say we're going like, to we, ca we cannot love you because you're too bad. So they called that meeting, and I said to this family that I was staying with, they were going there, and they said, are you ready to go? And I said, go where? And they said to this meeting. I said, I'm not going. I have no reason to go. I said, you can go tell them that they can excommunicate me. I don't want to be part of this church anymore. I don't need to be part of it. Just send, give them the message that I'm done. They can do whatever they want, but I'm not part of this anymore. So they went and they had their meeting, and it wasn't a successful meeting because they never experienced anything like that before because I was supposed to show up. So long story short, anyway, eventually it was kind of left undone. But what that did to me, it, it basically led me away from church. It led me away from God. It led me away from my family. All those things that God has put in our life for our benefits, for our good, it took me away from all that. I didn't want to have anything to do with church. I didn't want God. I didn't want family. None of that. So um, many years, fast forward now to my next story. Eventually, I had a desire to go back to church because that's how I was brought up. And it just, you know, it felt like the right thing to do. And so we've been through different churches and experienced different things together after that that were, like, not good either. But... Um, Eventually, we started Life Church. 
So we started this church here in Belize. Pastor Randy and Joan came and, you know, they got it started with us here. And um, Life Church is a church of grace. If you know our pastors in Canada, I know most of you haven't been there, but it's, they're operating under grace. Now, we were not used to that. So I don't know. I sometimes think that they maybe made a mistake with putting us in, in as pastors before they actually trained us. But, you know, God knows he does things really backwards sometimes, and I think it's one of those things. So we started a church that should be a church of grace, but we were still, all we knew was law. We hadn't been introduced to anything better. So now we had to learn about grace, and I experienced that in such a deep way that we can only roll with it now. But years into the ministry, we're still learning about it. And this one time, we had a meeting with our pastors from Canada, some other people in a meeting. And in that meeting, our pastor said something to Corny in a harsh way that really hurt me. I was very hurt because he said it in a very harsh way. And immediately, my mind started going to my past Okay, so now we're under these pastors again to control us, to speak to us harsh. Now we're back in church to get hurt. You know, all those things start going through my mind. And I'm like, you know what? I did not sign up for this. I stood up and I walked out of that meeting. I was a pastor. Keep that in mind. I stood up and I walked out of that meeting. I'm like, I'm not doing this thing over again. I'm not signing up to be in a church to get hurt again. And... Um, let me tell you one thing, though. If you expect your pastor to be perfect, then you're in the wrong church. We aren't there yet. And our <laughs> pastors weren't perfect either, so we're learning to do life together. So anyway, what happened there was so hurtful for me, I wouldn't talk to my pastors. I would not talk to them. They laughed back for Canada, and I didn't go talk to them. I didn't allow them to come over. That was it. I was done. Now, you would think they could have come and just kicked me out and said, you know what, Life Church isn't working in Belize. These, you know, we can't communicate. We can't make things work. But being that Pastor Randy was a man of wisdom, a man full of grace. So after months of not speaking and communicating because I had shut the door, he came up with a wisdom plan and was totally God. And he said, would you allow someone else, and this came through Corny because remember, I wouldn't talk to them. So he said, would you allow someone else to come and talk to you, a pastor that you trust? Can we bring someone over to work on restoration? And this person that they asked if they could bring her over, I said yes, because she had helped me with healing in the past, and I had learned to trust her. So I said, yes, I'm willing to talk to her. And so with her coming over, she was a pastor from the States, with her coming over and speaking to me, it brought enough healing that I could start restoring my relationship with my pastors again. And it led to an amazing breakthrough for me after that, just a huge breakthrough of freedom and connecting with my pastors in a deeper level than what I had ever connected before. Now, why was I able to connect? Because they applied grace. They could have kicked me out. I wished at that time they did. But they didn't do what I was used to from the past. They just walked in grace and in wisdom. And that grace led towards restoration. So why I'm sharing these two stories, I want you to see the difference between a church operating under law and then another church operating under grace. So Life Church is founded on grace. And I have experienced that with my pastors. And that's why we're here in the city is because we need a church of grace. Amen. So here's the thing. When you walk in, 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 in the law, it's all cookie cut. You do this, you're okay. You do this, you're wrong. But under grace, it also requires you to learn to walk in the Spirit and learn to communicate with the Holy Spirit. And He wants to be your friend. And that is why I refuse to teach you how, what, what, is, what all is wrong or what is right. I want you to experience it with God. If I tell you, okay, if you, if you don't do this and you do that, then everything is okay, then I've made a religion out of that. But if I teach you to have a communication with, with, with the Holy Spirit yourself, then the Holy Spirit can teach you to walk in grace and know what is right. Amen? And to end my testimony, I had done nothing to deserve that grace from my pastors. 
I have done nothing to deserve Jesus dying on the cross for me. And the same is true for all of us. We don't deserve grace. It's undeserved favor. No. Grace is not something we can do, something we can work for, something that we deserve. Not from man nor from God. But God was so good that Amen. he sent Jesus. Can we get the team up? Where's Eber? Can we sing? We want to... We we want to end with a song. This song we don't haven't sang for a sang song sung for a long time. We we used to sing it every Sunday, so we call it the national anthem of, of Life Church. Uh, so we haven't sang it for a while, but it's called "This Is Amazing Grace." And when you understand what grace really is, it has a whole different meaning for you. So I want to ask you to all stand up as we close with this song. And during this song, just think about Jesus on the cross what he did for you, and the grace. When he came, grace came. Well, he's looking for a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you for all that came out this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would truly understand what you came to do for us. Let us experience the grace that you came to give us and that we can live in, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father God, that we would, that we would um, um, just extend grace to people around us, Lord God. That we would extend grace the way we received it, Father God. That we got what we didn't deserve and we didn't get what we deserved, Lord. Let us operate in every, every day, Father God, in that way. Help us, teach us, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, guide us. Guide us, Holy Spirit. I pray, Father God, that we would experience you in a new way. And I pray, Lord, that we, all of us here, we would go out of this place and we would utilize, we would use the power that you have invested in us to create environments and change atmospheres wherever we go, Father God. Help us to do that, Lord Jesus. Let us be the light in the south that brings light into darkness and a flavor into this world, Father God. I pray, Jesus, that we would grow in you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you. Amen. Well, um, I didn't find the folder, so we're just going to make the Holy Spirit lead us into singing, right? I think but, I know it by, by memory, so... Um, um, how is everybody doing this morning? How is everybody doing? Can I hear hallelujah? Hallelujah. All right, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Who brings the power of sin and darkness? the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us redness in our wonder the king of glory the king above all kings come on sing it out this is amazing grace this is unfailing love day would say my place 
Come on, let's hear those hands. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy. Hallelujah. Here's my last words before you go today. The heart of my heart and the heart of the pastors in this ministry and the heart of this, the leaders of this organization, this ministry, we want to create such an environment of grace, mercy, that you're not going to be afraid to make a mistake. Because a mistake does not have to be punished. My pastor always tells me, Corny, if you're not making a mistake, you're not trying hard enough. And so I want to tell you here, never be, be afraid. Oh, you know what? I might not do this right, so I, I won't do anything. No. Just, that thought just threw that away. Your heart to serve God is what it takes. The mistakes come and the mistakes go, but the grace of God remains. And so I want to let you know, in this place, we make mistakes, we learn, we grow, and we become better. And you know, Jesus died on the cross. He took on the condemnation for your mistakes. You're not condemned for a mistake. You're encouraged to become better. And when you understand who you're created to be, you want to be better. Amen? And I got to tell you that my relationship is restored with my family, with my church, and with my God. All because of grace. So if that's what you want, you're in the right place. So if you're here this morning, I know we should go home. I know everybody's watching a watch. Just one hour, one hour, one hour has gone. No way. Anybody here that, that wants to experience grace and you have, never, you have never made a decision to follow Christ and you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I want to experience grace. I want to experience what God has done on the cross for me. If you're here and you're that person, I want to pray with you. Is there anybody here? Lift, raise your hand. If you're here and you want to experience grace, you want to experience the grace of God, you want to serve God for who He is. Anybody here? Amen. I see you. I see you. Anybody else? Or is there anybody that grew up in religion and has never experienced God, uh, grace and would want that? Anybody here? You all good with that? Okay, I'll take your word. That's, that, I want those that raise their hands, we're going to pray a prayer together. And I want, if you could all repeat after me. And those that raise their hands, I want you just, your decision that you're making today is for eternity. And makes a difference, right? So, Lord, say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I need you. I ask you to forgive me. I receive you. I receive what you did for the cross, on the cross for me. I make you my Lord and Savior. Come into my life and make me a new person. And thank you for grace. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you are born again. The Bible says 20,000 angels are rejoicing for you. So God bless you guys. I want, please, the two people that raise their hands, I want to, we don't want to talk to you before you leave. And so, 
God bless you guys. Have an amazing week. And remember, grace came so you could live well. And please extend it to your family and friends around you. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. There is food being sold back there. I'm not There's sure what, but something is being there for you. So pick up your full house for three dollar. Oh, okay. There's full house for sale in the back. That's for, for the fundraiser for the building. So God bless you guys. And you are dismissed.